previously on 8-Bit Show and Tell. I am the C64. Here is a set of tutorial programs to help you get the most out of your Commodore 64. There's six volumes here. Overall introduction to the C64. Oh, some little guys dropping down. Shoot. Get them! Why are you just sitting there? Introduction to the keyboard. Yeah, it does accurately have the Petsky symbols there of the heart and the bottom left corner there. Press the S key to continue. Whoop. Introduction to the basic programming language. Okay. Ooh. Wow. Advanced basic programming techniques. 30 minutes. Okay, so I am going to split this up into multiple videos. Hi, it's Robin, and we're going to continue on with volume four of I Am the C64. This volume covers advanced basic and will require 30 minutes to complete. Press and key continue. Hi, welcome back. In this volume, we will discuss advanced basic commands, including color and graphics. Press and key to continue. That's some kind of 3D race car. Input. Input is used to input new data into a running program. After typing the data, press return to enter data and continue. Print, what is your age? Input A, rem, numeric data, your age is A. Okay, so we're running it. What is your age? I am five. Your age is five. Well, I thank you. Input your name, string data. Hello, A string, all right. So we're inputting, hello Robin. Get is used to get data one character at a time. Do not press return because I do not stop the program. If you want me to wait until a key is pressed, an extra statement is required. Okay, so line 10, print how many quarts do you have? 20, get A. P equals A times 2. If A is less than 1, then 20. And A equals quartz. All right, that seems like a strange way of doing it. It's basically multiplying the quartz by 2 to get pints, but it's doing the math over and over again and then checking. Well, I guess it kind of saves a line. I don't know. All right. How many quartz do you have? Uh, H. Well, that didn't work. T quartz. Nope. I have zero quartz. Nope. I have nine quartz, and that equals 18 pints. Okay. What is your favorite letter? Get a string. If a string equals, like, null, then 20. And... <laughs> what is your favorite letter? C. C is your favorite letter. Read and data are used to enter long lists of data into program. I read the values from the data statements one at a time. Commas are used to separate pieces of data. Okay, so we've got a loop for x equals 0, 2. We're reading L, and then we're just printing out L. So it's just going to print out 5, 10, and 15. All right. GoSub is used when one task is repeated several times throughout the program. I will go to the subroutine at the specified line number. When I receive the return command, I will return to the statement after the GoSub. Yep. To simplify programming, I have several built-in numeric functions. For example, my integer function is used to eliminate fractions. These are more of my numeric functions. The absolute value, cosine, sine and the square root. That absolute value, it makes all numbers positive. All right. I guess that's just an example of integer. It just chops off the decimal, or as they call it, fraction. And the square root of 9, 3, and 4. Random 1 is a numeric function that will generate a random number between 0 and 1. To get a random number between two numbers, use this formula. All right. Okay. 
Ooh, there's the long one. Hey, it's craps. I did that video on pet craps recently. Is that really a whole game? First I, second I, first die, it should be, on line 30. Oh, <laughs> well, a winner, another roll. Seven craps, a loser. Another roll? Yes. Seven craps, a loser. Ooh, I have bad luck here. Seven craps, a loser. Eleven craps, a user. <laughs> Lose. Ooh, seven is a winner. Yeah, I won. I did a lot better on the pet version. Every symbol in my character set corresponds to a number. This set of numbers, which includes my keyboard controls, is the ASCII, or we like to say Petsky code, ASCII 2. I don't understand why it says ASCII 2. Hmm. To obtain the code for any character, use the ASCII, quote, X, close quote, string function. Okay, so give the, the Petsky numbers for those three symbols. To obtain the character from the ASCII code, use the character string X string functions. The ASCII code numbers are 0 through 255. All right, so it should print those three characters. In a print statement, the character string function of a control key will perform the same as the control key in direct mode. All right, so it just keeps printing character. Huh, on lines 30. It actually says character S instead of character dollar sign. <laughs> all those lines 30 through like 90, are those all typos? I don't think it's really executing this code anyway. It just seems to be printing it and then running it separate. So I assume it'll work even with all those typos where there should be a dollar sign. Okay, well, let's see what happens. A bunch of hearts. My memory is divided into 65,536 blocks. Okay. Uh, each block has a specific location or address. Peak is a numeric function to peak or look at data contained in a specific address. 40. Oh, I see. It's got a bunch of blocks and they're numbered above and below. That's a bit confusing, but okay. Peak zero. So I guess it should display 47 and 4. I don't know why there's a comma after the peak 0 at the end of line 10. Um, I thought you had to add a semicolon. Does just a comma on its own work? Ooh, i got to try that sometime. At the end of line 10, there's a comma by itself. I thought you had to put a semicolon at the end for it to hold the position for the next print. That comes along. But according to this, just a comma will do the same. Poke is used to put a number into a specified address. For example, if address 650 is poked with 200, then any key will repeat if held down. Okay, that's an example. I mean, I always poked 128 in there, not 200, but would you like to try? So yeah, now we can hold down any key. <laughs> we can kind of break it there anyway. The value stored in address 53281 tells me the screen background color. Address 53280 tells me the screen border color. These are the values to poke in for my colors. Black, white, red, say, so yeah, okay. So I had to kind of squeeze in number 10 there, light red. Oh, once again, line 10, that's not a dollar sign. It's like an S. Poke 532... Cursor down. Okay, well, that's going to flash the screen. Wow. <laughs> that is wow. My screen can hold 1,000 characters, 40 columns by 25 rows. Screen memory is normally addresses 1,024 through 2,023. Correct. Any character can be poked into specified screen address. Also, you must specify character color. You don't necessarily have to. 55296. RAM color is white. Okay, it doesn't actually spell out that 55296 is where the color RAM is. Uh, it depends on the, as we've talked about before, it depends on the kernel revision 
and how the screen gets cleared initially about whether you actually have to poke the color in or not. But this was made early enough. They probably had kernel version 2 back in 1983, uh, like I did, and you did have to poke the color. There we go. All right. Guess that would be more interesting if they changed the color or something, <laughs> or didn't clear the whole screen. Ugh. Screen memory map. Use this equation to plot a point P equals 1024 plus X position plus 40 times Y position. Address 1024 is the top left of the screen. For example, the red box is in column 19 and row 2. I don't, is that a red box up there? It just looks like a black square above the word memory, row 2, column 19. Oh, or maybe it'll do it when I continue. Nope. Oh, well. The color of each character on the screen is controlled by color memory. Address five addresses, 55296 through 56295, tells me address. Yeah, okay. Tells me the color of the character in address 1024 through 2023, respectively. Okay. Sure. Let's run the program. All right. So it looks like it's just cycling through the 16 colors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's kind of a nice pattern. Okay. You can now form games for your pleasure. <laughs> Consider this. <laughs> okay. Would you like to flip a coin? So, yes or no? Press anything but no. Line 40, heads or tails. You're a good sport. Okay. That is a long listing. Would you like to flip a coin? Well, better say yes at least once. Heads. Winner. This is for our pleasure. Would you like to flip a coin? Tails. Heads. You're a good sport. Would you like to flip a coin? No. So each programming exercise has several solutions. Try to choose the shortest and simplest solution. You have now completed Volume 4. You're ready for I Am the C64 Volume 5 Sprites. Well, that was never 30 minutes, was it? Okay, press any key to quit. Do you want to quit? Yes. All right, loading Volume 5. Okay, we're going to run Volume 5. I am the C64 Volume 5. Again, written by the Polkies. Here we go. <phone rings> Copy protection. And we wait. Well, those songs keep getting shorter. Must be loading in data or something. Okay, at any point in this program, oh, we can view the index and quit with F3. That's a new feature, and we can S to stop a song, but we can't hit Q to quit, apparently. This volume covers sprite graphics and will require about 20 minutes to complete. Hi, welcome back. In this volume, we will discuss sprite graphics. A sprite is a programmable object that can be moved anywhere on the screen. Ooh, I like these squares. It's like block demo. Ooh. It is a sailboat. A byte is made up of eight bits, binary digits. A bit is the smallest piece of information I can handle. Numerical values for each bit are shown below. Numerical values, 128, 64, 30. Bit numbers, seven through zero, ah, sure. Each of the eight sprites is drawn on a grid that has 21 rows of three bytes. If a bit equals zero, then it will not be seen on the sprite. It will be transparent. 
the value of each byte is equal to the sum of its bits. Okay. Yep. Oh! Red, white, and blue. I guess that does help to make it clear that there's three separate bytes there uh, for each row. Of course, you can't individually define the colors like that, but you see the spray in the bottom right corner, that's correct. Well, that's kind of cool. So yeah, it's just showing that you can get all the data from it. We used to do that on graph paper back in the day. The data from the grid is poked into 63 memory locations beginning at almost any multiple of 64. Interesting. Locations 2040 to 2047 point to where the data for sprites 0 through 7 is stored. If data for sprite 0 begins at 832, 13 times 64 equals 832, poke 2040, comma 13. Okay. Sprites are controlled by 47 special memory locations beginning at 53248. These memory locations are called registers and are numbered to simplify programming. Okay. Yeah, so this is what I use often, this V equals 53248, which is the base of the VIC-2 chip in memory. And this is just a pattern that Commodore used in their own books. That's what I learned from, and the Paholkis must have used those same books as well. Position registers, on off, collision detection. Some registers use one byte to control all eight sprites. This is accomplished by assigning one bit to each sprite. For example, register 21 is used to turn sprites on and off. To turn on sprites 0 and 2, poke V plus 21, comma, 5. Yep. Each sprite has two registers to control its position on the screen. When using sprites, the screen will have 320 horizontal locations, and 200 vertical. It's not entirely true. The screen has that many pixels, but because sprites are up to 24 pixels wide, or actually even double that, 48 if you expand, and 21 or 42 if expanded in the Y, there's actually that many more positions. You can have a sprite partially, you know, just the right side of it visible on the left side of the screen, or over on the right side of the screen, you have just the left side of it visible. So there's actually more, well, anyway. And the sprites are positioned with reference to the upper left-hand corner. Yeah, which is not zero, zero. Motion is achieved by gradually increasing or decreasing the position registers. 50 through 250. I am not entirely happy with that description because at 50, the sprite is fully on the screen, but at 250, it's fully off, but it doesn't describe the positions for the sprite slide off the screen to the top. Oh, it's just... Yeah, I don't know. And actually, the Y loop goes from 0 to 220, while the right side says 50 through 250. I don't know. It could be more accurate. The largest value for a byte is 255, and the sprite screen has 320 possible X positions. No. The sprite can be positioned in more than 320. Anyway, whatever. I'll, I'll stop arguing with it. Register 16 controls the most significant bit. The information in this register tells me which sprites are beyond 255. Uh, every once in a while they switch back to this I am the C64 language, but I don't think they're always using it, are they? For x equals 0, 255, poke v plus 0, I'm x. Okay, so it moves across the screen, and then it turns the most significant bit on to access the next 256 positions, but it only uses 0 through 90. Anyway, there we go. Okay. Even right there, example shows that they used, what, 256 plus 91 different positions between line 10 and line 30. Yeah, so it's got like 300 and 360 whatever positions it actually uses. So the example's right, the text is a bit wrong. Registers 23 and 29 are used to expand sprites in vertical and horizontal directions. Try it below. All right, so I guess we can poke whatever we want. 
Let's make them all big. So we'll poke them with seven. There. Now what happens if we try to poke with 255? Well, that's kind of fun. Yeah. Each sprite has a register to control its color. Sprite color codes are the same as screen color codes. Okay, so let's make that apple black. And let's make the sailboat gray three. And let's make the helicopter gray one. Should disappear. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's the same color as the background. Register 30 is the sprite to sprite collision register. Peek this register to see if two or more sprites have collided. All right. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's not the most reliable thing just because of the way uh, it can't handle multiple sprites client at the same time. And each time you peek it, it clears. So you can actually save it. Anyway. Register 31 is used to detect collisions between sprites and background. The collision registers are very useful for game programs. Well, potentially. <laughs> sprites can be moved in front of or behind one another. Lower number sprites always move in front of high number sprites. Okay, so that is correct. Still, when they say sprites can be moved in front of or behind one another, they kind of sounds to me like they're saying you can move them on top of each other and then the Vic will decide which one goes in front. The lower number sprite will move in front. Yeah, so it's more like sprite zero will be rendered on top of sprite one. That's just hard coded. Register 27 is used to move sprites in front of or behind background objects. Yes. This can be used to create 3D effects. You actually have control about whether the sprite is in front of or behind background objects, but only the foreground color and one of the two multicolor ones. Okay, so there's the helicopter in front of and behind. Using sprites and all their great features allows us to create very high quality graphics. Animation is created by drawing several pictures for one sprite and rapidly changing the sprite memory pointer. Yeah, so just poking 2040 with a different value shows the different frames of animation. And that's true, that can be done in basic very nicely. Okay, here's our old red, white, and blue again. Just showing the different data statements. Yeah, we did this all <laughs> by hand. Drew it on graph paper and then added up the bits, usually just by hand, not even a calculator. Well, I guess that's a bit tedious watching all that, but so I assume you get the idea that each bit on the left is a one if it's lit up and it's a zero if it's right. And then you add all those bits. Down at the bottom, it shows that the leftmost bit of each byte is worth 128 decimal, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. And then those numbers are just added up. All right, let me skip this. Nope. And finally, this is the fourth frame. I think this is it. So this is the frame where there, you can't see the helicopter blades at all. And that makes it look like it's spinning more, I guess. Okay. These five things must be done to make a sprite appear on the screen. Draw the sprite and figure data. Read data into memory. Set sprites memory pointer. Set sprites position. I guess that's missing apostrophes. And then turn on the sprites. Yeah, and I guess set them to a color that is not the same as the background. Sprites are only limited by your imagination. You are now ready for volume six. Bracket sound.
Okay, press any key to quit. Do you want to quit? Yes. And the final volume. Volume 6. How long will this one be? Okay, right, here we go. Run. I am the 64, volume 6. Written by the Pahokis. <laughs> one last time. That doesn't get old. It's thinking. Right on. So again, F1, F3. This volume covers the sound and music synthesizer. It will require about 20 minutes to complete this volume. There we go. Michael, row your boat ashore again. Hi, once again, this is your C64 at your service. In this volume, we will discuss my SID chip. That's my sound and music synthesizer. Michael, row your boat ashore. My sound generator is memory addresses 54272 through 54296. Like a radio, the first thing is to turn it on. Okay, there we go. We're clearing the chip by poking a bunch of zeros in it. It's interesting. Is that really turning it on? Like a radio, I have volume control. That was like initializing it. Poke 54296 with 0 through 15 for volume control. 0 is the quietest. 15 is the loudest. Choose the volume for the example. Well, of course, I don't know. I guess I'll just do 15. Oh, that's uh, green sleeves, isn't it? And we'll be funny and try volume zero. <laughs> We're hilarious. Okay, press return to continue. Each of the three voices is capable of a nine-octave piano range. Each note requires a poke statement for the high frequency and the low frequency of the note. Below is the high and low frequencies for a fourth octave. For a fourth octave. For the fourth octave? For a fourth octave. That's weird talk. I guess they're saying... Like the way octaves are numbered traditionally. Well, anyway, I don't know. Registers 54273, 54280, and 54288 control the high frequencies for voices one through three, and blah, 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 control the low frequencies. The values for the frequencies are zero through 255. Choose the high and low frequency for the note you would like to hear. Okay, I think this is especially poorly. <laughs> poorly explained. There is just one frequency per voice, but split into a low byte and a high byte. It's a 16-bit value, but because each register can only hold eight bits, it's split into two. But it's not like there are two frequencies. One is low and one is high. It is one frequency <laughs> split into two bytes. Okay, that's really poorly explained in my opinion. So five, five, and two, two. Really, it's like the high frequency is the high byte. And that's the one that's, that has a lot more meaning. When you change that value, it very rapidly changes the pitch of the note. But the low frequency can be thought of as like fine tuning it. So instead, I'm going to do 30, <laughs> I'm breaking it, 35 and 22. Each note of each voice can play four different sounds or waveforms. These waveforms are the triangle, sawtooth, pulse, and noise. Okay, those are okay diagrams illustrating the different shapes of those waveforms. Registers 54276, 83, 54290. It's funny that they didn't split this up just like on the VIC with V equals 53248 and then offset. Number the registers from zero up. I don't know why they didn't do that for this as well. 
Okay, so we can choose the waveform. So we'll try 17, the triangle waveform. Triangle has that kind of smooth sound to it. And sawtooth, 33. Type in too fast for it. So sawtooth has that more abrupt, kind of cut off edge. Pulse. Pulse has a more square sound to it. And of course, noise is going to be. <laughs> and yeah, noise is. It uses the random number generator built into the SID, which is really a 23 bit linear feedback shift register that just kind of outputs seemingly random numbers, but it's actually a predictable series with a length of, uh, how many is that? 23 bits? 8 million different numbers? Something like that. Uh, but it still is pitched. A note remains on until it's turned off. The duration of the note is determined by how long you wait until you turn it off. A quarter note's duration is approximately 250. Well, <laughs> a quarter note. Okay, it depends on the tempo, but <laughs> anyway, yeah. So it's saying that if you do a delay loop, just count for t equals 1 to 250, then that's about a quarter note. But a, what's a quarter note? A quarter note only has meaning when you know how long a bar is, like what the tempo is, beats per minute. Yeah, anyway, if so, yeah, if we make a longer delay, it'll last longer. Oop, and very short. <laughs> Barely fired. I can barely hear it if it's 50. Each note or tone that you hear consists of four basic parts. ADSR, attack, the rate a note rises from zero volume to maximum volume. Decay, the rate that the note falls from peak volume to mid-range volume. Sustain, the mid-range volume. And release, the rate a note falls from mid-range to zero volume. So yeah, that's, that's an okay explanation of this. And note that ADSR just affects the volume. It doesn't affect the pitch or the waveform. Attack decay rates are controlled by those registers. Attack rates are set by the high four bits or nibble. Decay rates are set by the low nibble. And then, yeah, you could just add up your ADSR. It's just the same as any of these other bit calculations like the sprites there. A med attack, a medium attack, and a high decay <laughs> med attack. Sustain and release are controlled by registers, blah, blah. Sustain is set by the high nibble and release. Okay. A song is several notes played one after the other. All right. That is a song. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a completely universal. Uh, anyway. Choose the attack, decay, and the sustain release for the example. I guess we can just put any... 120, I guess, number like 130 would be very middling. Oops. Oh, well, I guess I blew that. Oh, here, I'll try going back. I can write F1. 130. I like how it auto advances if you type three characters, but if you type one or two. Yeah, anyway. I can play one, two, or three voices together or in any combination or any combination. Remember to set the attack decay, sustain release, and the waveform for each voice. Consider this. Okay, so yeah, it's reading a bunch of values. Line 30 has all the reading. Lines 40 and 50 do the actual poking to set the frequency, and then it just loops. All right.
<laughs> I'm quite sure that that program listing did not generate the second song. It only generated the first one. It actually takes a lot of data, a lot of pokes, as you're seeing, to make some simple music in Commodore Basic. The number of sound effects you can create is infinite. Is it really? For example, try changing the volume while a note is on, or use the noise waveform to create an explosion sound. And there's some pokes. It's infinite in the sense that if you have infinite time, then you can make infinite sound effects. But I don't think you could make, in finite time, you can make finite sound effects. Well, I suppose that's always true, right? <laughs> that was gunfire. Everything you have learned, text, text graphics, sprite graphics, and music can be combined. So come on, show the master programmers how it's done. Remember, I can do nothing without you. This is the end of volume six. What's that dot on his hand? <laughs> that was funny. The melody uh, was doing these weird uh, out of time, like these extra beats or something. Okay, so that was it. That's the end of volume six. That was the nice closing show. Do you want to quit? No. Oh, yes. I do want to quit. Do you want to quit? Yes. And cue to quit. Ready. Let's look at that program. Okay, well, I guess we can be thankful that all their estimates were too high. That is a long program. I just think how long much time these guys put into each of these programs. So... Even if they're not great, you know, that it's an okay overview. Even if I was nitpicking uh, a bunch of little faults or whatever. <laughs> okay. Oh, it just goes on and on. These might be some of the longest basic programs ever. Wow. That's the destructory there. Yeah, 121 blocks for volumes four and six. Okay, so this might be the copy protection here. So I'm going to do another episode about this copy protection, maybe some other, because I find it's pretty interesting, but it's kind of its own subject beyond this. Let's try running it without the disk in the drive. Illegal copy. <laughs> we'll look at that copy protection in a future episode. Thank you, my patrons, for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.